I'm here today. Uh, Jeff asked me to come put a bit of context around what we're discussing. And I want to make the case that designing what he's called a new oceans economy requires a fundamental reorientation to our home in the cosmos. So it's about as contextual as you can get. But first, I want to know how you imagine Earth, right? What do you see in your mind's eye? And that probably depends on how old you are. The elders in the room probably envisioned something like this extraordinary photo taken from Apollo astronauts back in 1968, right? Everybody recognize this? If you're over like 50? Yeah? And you'll remember Carl, Carl Sagan's famous uh, phrase of the pale blue dot describing our ocean planet because three quarters of it is covered by water. But if you're younger, you probably imagine something like Google Earth, right? Like our visions of the planet of the world are actually transforming all the time. And this is because for the past few decades, these new technologies have given us much more intimate views of our home planet. But the novelty of being able to zoom down to our rooftops can actually sometimes really overshadow the extraordinary conditions and interactions that make the cycles of life possible on our planet. For instance, if we zoom out a bit, we can see that the Earth is in what's called the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone of our own solar system, represented by these colorful bands here. It's just the right distance from the sun where it's not too hot and it's not too cold. The temperature's just right to support abundant liquid water. But even this classical view of the solar system is incomplete. Just as we are orbiting the sun, the sun is orbiting around the galactic core of the Milky Way at incredible speeds. This particular perspective reveals the dynamic relational nature of our world, showing that we really are, as Bucky said, all astronauts aboard this living, watery spaceship. And the only reason we're here is because of the synergistic relationships of cosmic and planetary ecosystems. So for instance, we're constantly being bombarded by particles from the sun's solar winds. You hear about these sometimes when it knocks out power grids. These would have made life here impossible, but as the earth formed, it cooled down fast enough to maintain a molten core at its center. And this acts like a dynamo that generates a magnetic field, providing protection against cosmic rays. And this protection enabled the formation of a dynamic atmosphere that also acts like a radiation shield. And the energy from all of these interactions drives the planet's climates, feeding wind and ocean currents. The planet's temperatures are actually equalized by cold air and surface water moving towards the equator, while warm air and water moves towards the poles. And this has created the perfect conditions for life to evolve here. And as a consequence, the sea is actually the world's largest ecosystem, containing 99% of all living space on Earth. And we know that these interactions profoundly influence all life on Earth, not just in the oceans. For instance, this visualization of photosynthesis on the land shows how it's intimately connected to the photosynthesis in the seas. The dark green balloons of plankton that you see in the oceans ride the ocean currents and produce over half of the oxygen we breathe, in addition to driving global precipitation. The ocean's ecosystem services providing food, oxygen, water, climate regulation, they've been valued at over $21 trillion a year. And the importance of this productivity is made abundantly evident by the thousands of shipping lanes crisscrossing the seas. The oceans actually provide jobs for over 350 million people in industries worth over $1.2 trillion. But the dire consequences of taking the ocean's regenerative capacity for granted are becoming increasingly stark. This visualization from WWF shows that the global expansion of fishing fleets over the past few decades has been expanding rapidly. Since 1950, fishing areas have increased tenfold, with 87% of species either fully exploited or collapsed. But fortunately, Many economists and entrepreneurs, like everyone here, are recognizing the ocean is actually humanity's most valuable asset, but that we can no longer play by the old rules. Just as with this year's SOCAP's Oceans Track, 
the World Economic Forum and The Economist are now involved in hosting events about the futures of the oceans. The urgency of dealing with the interconnected threats, as Cheryl mentioned, of over, overfishing, ocean acidification, plastic pollution, irradiation, they're directly challenging the paradigm of perpetual growth and the fundamental assumptions of neoliberal economics that are really based on a 19th century understanding of science. So instead of externalizing costs for the sake of maximizing economic benefit, accelerating the good economy aboard our planetary spaceship requires understanding how the whole system truly is far more than the sum of its monetized parts. Because the most astonishing finding of the space age is that we don't simply live on a pale blue dot. Earth is the only place in the universe we've found that supports life. A new oceans economy must be based on the understanding that human civilization is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Earth's biosphere, and an economic activity must support instead of disrupt the conditions for life here. And if you'd like to dive deeper into these issues and new ways of seeing the world, I invite you to the Morrison Planetarium on Thursday night at the California Academy of Sciences, where my colleagues and I at the Worldviews Network will be visualizing the importance of informing innovative entrepreneurial strategies within this whole context of cosmic, global, and bioregional relationships. Thanks.